welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to continue on with the kind of again the antiquity period here. We finished up the political history, the cultural history of the Jewish people, the ancient Hebrews, and as those that civilization is developing and growing, of course, we have a few other ones that we need to talk about as well. Um, and as we talk about these few other civilizations, the Assyrians, the Neo-Babylonians, and the Persians, it is still going to connect with that overarching theme of, you know, the, the impact other civilizations have on the Jewish people. That was one of the, the three major points, if you remember, when we talked about the Hebrews, the political, the cultural, and the impacts other civilizations have on them. So you're going to see a little bit on this, and then you're also going to get a little bit, one more video after this on Rome and the role the Roman Empire has on Judea and on the Middle East. Uh, then we'll move on to the rise of Islam. And so all of this is important. Remember, all of this is also material you need for your first quiz. So just keep an eye on when your quizzes are coming up. Make sure you're still studying, doing the short answer filling questions. Uh, just make sure you're, you're kind of mainly filling the blank questions, honestly, most of them. And that you're just really prepared because you want to make sure you know all the material really, really well before the day of the quiz. All right. Um, so here's just our map again to remind us of what we've been talking about. Uh, we talked about the culture of the Hebrews over here in Judea. And now we're going to move on to the Assyrians, whose capital is way up there in the northern part of Mesopotamia, called Ninineb. So we'll start talking about the Assyrians. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these three civilizations, the Persians a little bit more. But the Assyrians and the Neo-Babylonians we're going to go through pretty quickly. So Assyrians. So for the Assyrians, just a few things I want you to know about them. Obviously, their capital, again, the city Nineveh, as you see there, listed. And there's a lot of Assyrian kings. I'm not going to ask you to know them all. I put this one man uh, down, Shalmaneser II, uh, only because he's often given a lot of credit for being uh, very early in the Assyrian civilization being one of their great conquerors, so to speak. And that is one of the characteristics I want you to know about the Assyrians, that they were a very strong militant society. I'll talk about the military here in a second. But you also have the Assyrian law codes that you were supposed to read as well. And I'm hoping as you read the Assyrian law codes, you did notice something, how very different they are from Hammurabi's code in one way. And that is, maybe you picked up on it, maybe you didn't, but the Assyrian law codes are much more brutal. Uh, the, as, as brutal as the Hammurabi law code is, the Assyrian law code has like a whole element of torture behind it. You know, it's that, Hammurabi's code was death, 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 death. The Assyrian law codes are death, torture, death, torture, 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 death. Um, and you get really sense of the Assyrian people that way. So anyways, they're a very brutal society. They're a very militaristic society. Now, when I say they're militaristic, what do I mean by that? Well, a few things to jot down, worth noting, is that they developed very good archers to fight. They developed um, engineering, like military engineers that would to go on campaign with them. So you'd have a military engineer that might get to, to a wall of a city, and then they would kind of build siege warfare if needed to break down the wall. They were really good at that. They had advanced cavalry forces. They had better uh, helmets and armor to fight than other civilizations we've been talking about. So overall, the Assyrians were one of the stronger military civilizations we've talked about. Why didn't they last longer then if they had such a strong military? Well, that goes to the other point I want you to know about them. There's, I guess, three big points I want you to know about the Assyrians. One, they're military. Two, they're very brutal. And when I say they're brutal, how do we know they're brutal? Well, we know they're brutal because we have sources from the Assyrians. Look, we have sources outside the Assyrians that describe them as brutal, but that doesn't do you any good. That's, you know, you have to look at who's writing the source. If you have a source by someone who's conquered by the Assyrians and they describe them, the Assyrians as brutal, they go, well, of course you describe them that way. You were just conquered by them. But we have Assyrian sources that tell us this. We have the Assyrian law codes, as you saw. That's a really good example. You have other things as well that shows the kind of the brutality of the Assyrians. Uh, you have speeches from Assyrian kings uh, that talk about they take their enemies and they cut them up into small pieces. Um, and then they take their small pieces and they feed them to the birds of the ocean. And, and I'm sorry, the birds of the sky and the fish of the ocean. Um, 
abortion. That'd be funny. Um, but you get the idea that they take individuals and they cut them up and they feed them to animals, right? And that's from the Assyrian kings. You have the Assyrian laws. And so overall, we're pretty confident they were pretty brutal people. And then the last thing I want you to know about them is that even though they were brutal, they did have art. And the style of art they had is called bas-relief art. Let me show you an example. So this is bas-relief art that we have. Um, and you look at it, when you even look at their art, you see their art, look at this guy, he, he's fighting a lion over here, right? Uh, and what bas-relief art, you don't pronounce the S, just so you know, it's kind of raised, so it's kind of a, a concrete slab that the images are raised on it. So that's the bas-relief art, it's a style of art. But even in their art, you see the, you know, the fighting, you see the archers, you see the guy wrestling the lion here. And so this is why we mean it's a pretty brutal society. But that's it. That's really all the major points I want you to know about the Assyrians, other than what I mentioned in the previous lecture. The other last point, if you don't have it down, is the Assyrians are the ones who did conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. And when they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, there were the 10 tribes, and those 10 tribes were forced to disperse all over. And so this is one of the things that the Assyrians did as well. All right, so that's it on the Assyrians. Hope all that's clear. You have all that information, plus the law codes that you, were, that you had to read, um, and that covers all of them. The Neo-Babylonians. The Neo-Babylonians, again, also located in Mesopotamia. They're in the southern part of Mesopotamia. And there isn't really much you need to know about them. The biggest thing you need to know about them is the Babylonian captivity. You see their dates from about 600 to 500 BC. I'm giving you the name of one Neo-Babylonian ruler, Nebuchadnezzar II. Um, and this is, I guess, a good place to just mention spelling. Whenever you take quizzes or exams, you know, obviously you want to get as close as possible as you can for spelling. If you misspell by a letter, it's not the end of the world. But if you misspell it so much that I don't even know what you're saying, that's going to be a problem. So, you know, uh, make sure you're clear on that. And also, I, I think I mentioned this before somewhere, but if you're using any closed caption, you know, I try to correct it, but it doesn't always correct well, the closed caption. And so always go by the key term spelling I'm giving you, not whatever you see on the closed caption. Uh, so the key terms or the key words that I, that I type up in the slides here that you're seeing, that's the spellings I want you to use, obviously. All right, so who is Nebuchadnezzar II? Why is he important? Well, he is the one responsible for this, the Babylonian captivity. What is that? So remember this kingdom of um, Judah in the south. And the kingdom of Judah in the south was conquered by the Babylonians. And Nebuchadnezzar II was the one that did that. He destroyed Solomon's temple. That's when Solomon's temple, the first temple, was destroyed. But then Nebuchadnezzar also captured about 120,000, right, of the Jewish inhabitants that lived in Judea. He took these 120,000 inhabitants and he held them captive in Babylonia. That's what's called the Babylonian captivity. Uh, so they're going to be held captive there, and they're going to be held captive there for a long time, about 70 years total. Uh, so what happens with them, we'll explain as we move on to the Persians, but for the Babylonians, that's really all you need to know, right? Their civilization doesn't last for too long in terms of being this dominant power in the Middle East because of who follows them. And who follows them is the story of the ancient Persians. So the Persians we're going to spend a little bit more time on. So the Assyrians and the Babylonians went through kind of quickly. Definitely those names and, and points I gave you want to know. But it's the Persian Empire that we really need to spend a little bit more time on. All right, so here's this map I've been using all this time, right, explaining where all these civilizations are, uh, the, the Hebrews, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. Well, just to give you perspective before we get to the key terms and these names you see here, everything you see on green on this map represents the Persian Empire. They dwarf everything else we've started to talk about this semester. This is your first major empire. Uh, in history. And so we need to talk about how do they do this, what happened to them, and basically I want to talk about the rise and fall of the Persian Empire. That's what you want to know. And as we do that, again, we'll talk about a couple other things we've been discussing as well. 
So the first person you need to know about is a man named Cyrus. You see his name there, Cyrus the Great. And again, you don't need to memorize these exact dates. Uh, these are three Persian emperors you need to know. Each of them is important. Um, and Cyrus, he's going to be the one most responsible for expanding the Persian Empire. Most of what you see in the area in green is conquered by Cyrus. Um, and their capital, again, is the city of Persepolis. Right over here, you see the city of Persepolis, uh, which is modern-day Iran, by the way. You know, a lot of people from Iran today actually like to be called Persians uh, because it ties in with their ancient heritage. So this is modern-day Iran. And so there from Persepolis is where Cyrus is going to begin to grow and expand. Now, how does he conquer so much territory in such short time period? The way Cyrus does this is he goes to these areas, whether it's Babylonia or Media or Assyria, any of these areas, and he tells the people there, you have a choice. You could fight me, Cyrus, mighty Persian emperor, in which case you will die because Cyrus developed a pretty strong army. Or he tells them you have a choice. You don't have to fight me. He says, join me. Join the Persian Empire. And he says, if you join me, then I will, this is the most important part, I will then allow you to keep your own way of life, your customs, your traditions, your religion, even your own local rulers. Just make sure you pay, and remember this for later on, taxes to me, Cyrus, mighty Persian emperor. If you pay your taxes to me, you can live your life, do what you want to do, but, you know, you got to be loyal to me. And if you're facing this situation, a lot of civilizations that the Persians conquered were like, well, why fight the guy? If I could keep my own way of life, my own religion, my own customs, I have to pay taxes anyways. This was a very effective way of expanding. And did he really mean it? And so one of the stories about Cyrus you definitely want to know is the story of the Babylonian captivity that I just mentioned. So as Cyrus moves into Babylonia, he conquers Babylonia. He sees the Jewish people there. The Jewish people go to Cyrus and say, hey, Cyrus, we hear you're, you're a compassionate person. You let people keep their way of life. We've been held captive in Babylonia in Babylon for 75 years roughly now. We want to go home. And what does Cyrus tell them? He says, yeah, go home, go back to Jerusalem, go back to Judea, make your own temple, rebuild the temple, which the Jewish people did, uh, practice your religion, just make sure you pay your taxes. So if you see on this map, yes, the whole area of Judea, Israel is in green, but the Jewish people are able to return, practice their religion, rebuild their temples. So the land is not under Jewish control, but the Jewish people are at least free to practice their religion under Cyrus, while as opposed to the Babylonians, they were held captive and enslaved. So these are, again, things that other civilization, the other impact civilization have on the Hebrews. Pretty interesting. So that's it for Cyrus. You definitely want to know all that, know how he expands, know those details. Again, just as another reminder, you're not just writing down these key words, right? Everything I say about the key words, you should be jotting down as well, just as another reminder early in the semester. All right, he dies. He's followed by his son named Cambyses. Cambyses uh, expands a little bit more. One area Cyrus didn't conquer that Cambyses does is Egypt. That's really all you need to know about Cambyses, that he further expands the Persian Empire and takes over Egypt, adds that to the Persian Empire. And then that takes us to his son named Darius I. And Darius I is also very important. You know, he, by now, the empire is pretty much conquered, right? He's not really conquering a lot of land. Uh, but we know Darius is very well organized. One of his great achievements is this royal road you could see here on the map, that long black line there that I just circled. That's the royal road. Uh, it's about an 1800 mile road that connects, you know, uh, Asia Minor, the coast of Asia Minor, all the way to the uh, city of Susa. Um, and then the coast of Asia Minor, that other term you should know is Ionia. Uh, so everything over here in the coast of Asia Minor is called Ionia. You'll need to know that term for another reason a little bit later. Um, uh, but anyways, he, you know, it's pretty impressive that he builds this a very effective road. He's also very organized. Um, I guess the other thing about Darius, he doesn't like it when things don't go well. You should probably remember that, and that'll be important in a few minutes. Uh, because Darius, you know, 
yes, you pay your taxes, yes, you know, you keep your way of life, but Darius also did not like it if something didn't go well. There's one story of one of his advisors, apparently, who planted some fruit trees without asking for his permission, and Darius was so upset about this that he either had him imprisoned or killed, they read different sources on this, uh, but, you know, just for planting fruit trees without asking for his permission. So when things don't go well, he's not happy. And it's actually during the reign of Darius that something pretty bad is going to happen to the Persian Empire. And the question is, what does happen to this Persian Empire? Because this is the dominant, dominant civilization in the Middle East. By the time we get to 500 BC, if you just want to use round numbers, by 500 BC, the Persian Empire is now fully in control of the Middle East, all the Middle East, right? Except for the Arabian Desert, obviously, area, as you can see on the map. So what happened? How does the Persian Empire fall? And the fall of the Persian Empire is incredibly important for Middle Eastern history. Guys, if the Persian Empire does not fall, the entire history of the Middle East is different, right? You don't see the rise of Islam. You don't see the rise of Christianity, probably. Uh, you don't see so many things happening in Western civilization and Middle Eastern history if the Persian Empire doesn't fall. So we need to know what happened to that. And so let's talk about this. The Persian Empire is going to get hit a couple of times um, between about 500 and 300 BC in that 200 year period. All right, so here we go. The fall of the Persian Empire. And the fall of the Persian Empire has to do with what we call the Persian War, the first step. What's the Persian War? Well, during the reign of Darius I, you see this region again, Ionia, that I mentioned before. So that's that term you need to know, Ionia. Around the year 500 BC, Darius wanted to expand further westward. Where? To Greece. Now, I cover this in much more detail in my History of Western Civilization class, the Persian War. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you do need to know about it a little bit because this is what helped bring the fall of the Persian Empire. What's the deal of the Persian War? So, there were Greek cities living in Ionia. And the Greek cities living in Ionia around 500 BC decided to go to the Persian emperor at the time, who was Darius I, right? This is how the Persian War begins. And tell Darius I, we don't want to pay taxes anymore to you. This is known as the Ionian Revolt. That's that key word you see there, Ionian Revolt. And that happened right around 500 BC. And Darius was really angry when he mean they're not going to pay us taxes and all of that. And this eventually helps trigger an entire war between the Greeks and the Persians. Now, there are historians who say the Ionian Revolt was just an excuse, that Darius was always planning to attack the Greek world anyways, and this was the excuse he was waiting for to expand. Because if you think about it, his father expanded, his grandfather expanded a lot. Darius wants some, some expansion as well. And the next logical piece of real estate was to take on these Greek, this Greek civilization. Now, the Greeks were fragmented at the time. There was no united Greek civilization. They were actually divided up into what we call little Greek city-states, um, and they were very independent from one another. So there was no united Greek force. Darius knew that. And so starting around 500 BC, he's going to slowly try to pick apart these little Greek cities. Now, the two biggest Greek cities, you've heard of, I'm sure, are Athens and Sparta, but there are a lot of other little Greek city-states. And the way Darius does this is interesting. He doesn't take a massive army. When this Persian War begins, the Persian versus the Greeks around 500 BC after the Ionian Revolt, Darius doesn't take a massive army and just crush down the, the Greeks. Instead, he just sends a small force with an emissary. And they go to one of these little Greek city-states. Now, you got to understand, these Greek city-states were small. Some of these Greek city-states maybe had a population of 20, 30,000 people in them. And when we mean city-state, it's a city that it's its own country, right? So their own little independent nation of about 30,000 people. And the Persian Empire is massive, if you have you know, perspective on this, right? And the Persian Empire's army is bigger than the entire population of the Greek world. And so he just sends a small group of forces, and what happens is interesting. He sends this group of forces to a Persian, to a Greek city. And they knock on the door, and the, per the Greek city goes, well, who is it? And the Persians say, it's us, the Persians. And uh, the Greeks go, what are you on? And the Persians say, we've come for earth and water. And then a moment of silence takes place. The gates open up. 
and the leader of the Greek city-state comes out with two pots, all right? In one pot, I don't know how well you can see this here, but there is earth, and in the other pot, water. He takes these pots of earth and water, and he presents them to the Persian embassy. What has he just done? Well, he's basically just surrendered. And this is how Darius begins to conquer the Greek world. He just starts making city-state after city-state surrender to them by giving them earth and water. Why do these city-states not put up a fight? Well, they're small little city-states. The thing is for Darius, he does this for a while, but eventually there are these two powerful city-states, Athens and Sparta. And Athens and Sparta basically tell Darius, no, 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 we are not going to go along with this. We're not going to give you earth and water. And they refuse. And when Athens and Sparta kind of stand up to Darius, all the Greek city-states do something they've never done. Um, and it's fun. If you get a chance to take History 110, if you haven't done so yet, please do. It's a lot of fun learning about all this stuff. Uh, but the, the Greeks, they, they don't like each other, but now they have a reason to unite, and they do. And when the Greeks united, they were able to put up a pretty amazing front against Darius. There are a couple of battles. Um, that you know, There's actually more than a couple, but one of the more famous battles called the Battle of Marathon in the year 490 BC, when a Persian general, Datis, tried to attack um, the Greek world in the Battle of Marathon. So Datis was a Persian general in the year 490, tried to attack the Greeks, and he failed. He lost. The Greeks won the Battle of Marathon. And then about 10 years later, there's another very important battle called the Battle of Salamis. That's in 480 BC. And in that battle, these Greek ships, these Greek ships known as the Triremes uh, that you see there, um, this, so this image here is of the Greek ships called the Triremes, right? Uh, and they destroyed the Persian fleet. And there's a lot more to these battles. The Battle of Marathon's got a lot more details. The Battle of Salamis. There's another battle maybe some of you have heard of before called the Battle of Thermopylae. That's what they did the movie The 300 on. I cover all that in my History of Western Civilization class. But these two battles, Marathon in 490 and then the Battle of Salamis in 480 when the Persian fleet was destroyed, devastated the Greeks. I'm sorry, devastated the Persians. Um, and this really defeated the Persians. By now, the son of Darius, Xerxes I, uh, was in power. And when Xerxes was in power, um, that's when the Persian fleet was destroyed at the Battle of Salamis. So uh, Darius is the emperor during the Battle of Marathon in 490. And Xerxes is the emperor during uh, the Battle of Salamis in 480 BC. But after these two battles, the Persians just kind of give up. Um, they go up, oh, not worth it. It was too big of a fight. We lost too many men and they kind of go back home. But what the Persian War did do, it didn't destroy the Persians, but fighting the Greeks for about 20 years weakened them dramatically and left the Persian Empire vulnerable. Vulnerable to another invasion, which will finally destroy this Persian Empire. So remember, I said two things are going to destroy the Persian Empire. One was this Persian War. That just took a lot of resources, a lot of manpower. Uh, at one point, the Persians were putting in like 500,000 men into this war, crazy numbers, and they had nothing to gain for it. So they lost a lot of men, resources, money, and then they left them vulnerable. Vulnerable to who? Well, this guy named Alexander. And again, without getting into a lot of detail here, what you're seeing on this map is the the the, the quest of Alexander the Great. Now you can see this is 330 BC. This is more than a hundred years later, so we've skipped a lot of time. But around the year 330 BC, Alexander, known as Alexander the Great, uh, if you don't know where he's from, he's from Macedonia. Uh, Macedonia is just north of the Greek world. Um, he leads a massive invasion and he conquers the entire Persian Empire. Uh, everything you see colored here is areas that uh, Alexander the Great conquers. How is Alexander able to do this? Well, he's able to do this because the Persians are really weak at the time. 
the Persian emperor at the time was Darius III, and Darius III just could not stand up to Alexander. In fact, Darius III uh, was eventually forced to have his daughter marry Alexander, um, and Alexander took control of the entire Persian Empire. Now, what happens, of course, that's the fall of the Persian Empire. What happens to all this territory in the Middle East? Well, let me go one more map here and just kind of wrap all this up. So, again, Alexander is an amazing story. It's another one of these individuals in my History 110 class. I spend like a half hour talking about Alexander. In this class, just know the name. Know he's from the Kingdom of Macedonia. Know he defeats Darius III. And know that he was the one responsible for the final fall of the Persian Empire. After Alexander dies, he kind of dies at a very young age, Alexander. And if you look at our map of the Middle East, what basically happens is it all fragments. You don't need to know this, all these different families, Seleucid and Ptolemy and all these things. These are just various kingdoms that Alexander's uh, empire created afterwards. And so the Persian Empire is basically gone. There is some area of the Persian Empire that's around still, but it's just nothing. And so the whole area is fragmented. And from the time of the fall of the Persian Empire, uh, around 300 BC, and then the fragmentation under after Alexander, around 300 BC, there really isn't a strong uniting force in the Middle East. The Romans will come into parts of the Middle East. The Romans will move into Asia Minor. The Romans will move into Judea. The Romans will move into Rome. Uh, so the Romans will kind of control parts of the Middle East, right? And we'll do a little bit of lecture. Our next lecture is going to be a little bit on what the Romans do when they go into the Middle East, specifically in Judea. Uh, but overall, they don't control the whole Middle East. And when the Persian Empire collapses, it's just going to kind of leave the area more fragmented. Again, the Romans will have their little shot there. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, but then after the Romans, there's nothing at all. And when that happens, that leaves the whole area vulnerable and open for a new group of people, a new ideology. And eventually what this all opens the door for will be the rise of Islam, the rise of the dynasties of the Umayyads and the Abbasids and eventually the Ottomans, the things that you really associate with Middle Eastern history much more. A lot of what I've been giving you the first few lectures here, a lot of people kind of associate a lot of times more with Western Civ. I think obviously they have tremendous impacts in the Middle East. Otherwise, I wouldn't be spending this much time talking about it. Uh, but we'll get into more kind of the traditional period of what what all this means in the Middle East as we get to that point, as we get to the uh, rise of Islam and the Umayyad and the Abbasids. So we just have one more lecture on the antiquity period I want to cover, and that's what happens when the Romans move in. And I'm not going to talk about the whole Roman period of time in the Middle East. I'm mainly going to focus on what happens when Rome moves into Judea, because it does have very long-term implications to the Middle East today. So I hope all that was clear, right? That was kind of a super brief version of a lot of things I cover in more detail in other classes, uh, but it should still give you a pretty good kind of chronology of what's going on in the Middle East during the antiquity period. All right, thank you if you found all that interesting. If you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Have a good day.